All right. Good evening, everyone. My name is Cody Carver. Uh, on behalf of the Anchorage Museum, uh, I just want to say how glad we are uh, to have you here. I'm proud to host uh, the Alaska Historical Society and Cook Inlet Historical Society's uh, panel and lecture series, uh, both in person and online. Uh, down below the steel of this building and the concrete, uh, the Anchorage Museum uh, sits on Danaina Ethnena, Danaina Homeland. Uh, it is because of the stewardship of the Danaina people uh, that folks like me who are guests on this land are able to be here to enjoy and, and to discuss the important issues uh, that make up our, our civic life here. And we're, uh, we're, we're very grateful to, to have that. Um, now, before I introduce our friends uh, at our respective historical societies, just want to make a couple of announcements for the people in the room. Uh, the bathrooms, if you need them, are going to be down this ramp and to the left uh, before you exit the auditorium. And folks uh, watching online are tuning in on a platform called Crowdcast. Uh, a recording of this lecture uh, will be available at the very same link that they're using to watch it live. Uh, you, you may have used uh, the link to, to register so you have access to the recording. It's all one link, so we try to make it nice and easy. Um, there will be an opportunity during the program to ask a question. We have a uh, wireless mic here that uh, Dick Milius will be running around the audience, so be thinking of good questions. Uh, and uh, for the people online, they are able to type their questions into the uh, chat or the ask a question feature, and we have a representative uh, in the room that will be uh, vocalizing those in the room and relaying it to the speakers. Uh, so without further ado, uh, it's with great pleasure that I invite uh, Dick Milius to welcome us uh, to this program. Thank you, Cody. I'm Dick Milius. I'm president of Cook Inland Historical Society and the board of Cook Inland Historical Society wants to thank everybody for coming tonight and welcome you to the first lecture in our four-part series that we're co-hosting with the Alaska Historical Society. Information on upcoming lectures can be found on our website or on the Alaska Historical Society website or the museum website. Um, and if you do have questions, we're going to ask folks to hold those questions till the end of the presentations, um, but we will have plenty of time for questions. If you enjoy these programs, please join or donate to Cook Inland Historical Society and the Alaska Historical Society. And uh, now to introduce tonight's program a little more, I'll introduce David Ramser, who's president of the Alaska Historical Society. Thank you, everybody. Thanks, Dick. I need to be careful on those stairs. I don't want to mess up my other rotator cuff here. Uh, thanks to Dick and the Cook Inlet Historical Society for partnering with us on this series and much more over the years. The origin of this series began with our society's concern over the current state of civil discourse and the often willful distortion of history at the national and local levels. We have long believed that knowledge of history can inform and improve public policy debate. And by doing so, we hope to raise the level of discussion so that an informed public can encourage decision makers to draw on history to make fact-based policy that serves a broad diversity of Alaskans. Will Schneider, our moderator tonight and a former AHF, AHS president, has been the vision and force behind this effort that we're uh, starting tonight. After a three-decade career as a professor at the University of Alaska Fairbanks, Will has focused his ample energy on improving civil discourse in our state and on his Fairbanks dog team. And we're also grateful to the Atwood Foundation for a generous grant to help support the series. As Dick mentioned, this is a four-part series. Uh, those of you in the auditorium tonight hopefully picked up a flyer out, front, out back, uh, which talks about the other ones. Um, they're also on our website and Cook Inlet's website. The next series is November 16th on the Americanization of Alaska. And then uh, in spring, March 21st, we'll focus on conservation and development. And then finally, the last is on April 18th, and that focuses on climate change. 
So let is jump, let's jump right in with Will Schneider. you have in front of you are some questions that the students at West Valley High School in Fairbanks have asked us to present to you. And so as we continue tonight, perhaps at different points you wish to address those questions or some of them, and that would be great. Well, again, my welcome to the first in the Critical Issues Lecture Series tonight. And I want to, if you like what you hear tonight, I invite you to a session on Monday afternoon, that's the 23rd, at 4 o'clock, where we're teaming up with Olay here in Anchorage. And Gretchen will have more to say about that after we finish the panel discussion. Well, uh, I think that it's, what we're facing here in Alaska is a lack of understanding what native sovereignty means and where it's going. And so what we have done is assemble the experts here to talk about that so that we're able to gain some sort of grounding. And my hope is that we all leave this auditorium with a greater understanding and an ability to talk about the subject. So we have David Case, who's with us tonight. He's the author, along with David Volokh, of the classic volume, Alaska Natives and American Laws. We have Alex Cleghorn, uh, who is the chief executive officer, <coughs> operating officer, that is, of the Alaska Native Justice Center. And we have Dr. Rosita Wurl, who is president of Sea Alaska Heritage Institute. I've asked them to help us better understand this issue. So I think we'll jump right into it. Oh, I should mention one other thing. Uh, this will be recorded, and it will be available on the Alaska Historical Society website. So please keep that in mind. Uh, I think we'll begin with David talking a little bit about the history of the concept of sovereignty. So David. Thank you very much, Will. Um, my name is David Case. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. My name is David Case. And um, my father was Kenneth Case. My mother was Winifred Case. My dad um, grew up in western Washington, and my mother was from Little Rock, Arkansas. And she came uh, north, as many did, from the south uh, uh, in later years and uh, met and married and fell in love and married my dad. And she always liked to say I, she was 21 before she realized that damn Yankee was actually two words. Um, and uh, my, fa my father and my mother gave my brother and me a, the irreplaceable gift of their unconditional love when that was, I think, a concept that was not even known. Um, my, I, I fortunately uh, celebrated my 50th wedding anniversary, my wife and I, uh, this past month. Her name is Dorothy. We have two children, uh, two grown sons, in whom we are much blessed. Um, and the last thing Dorothy said to me on the phone today, she said, um, speak slowly and keep your hands away from your mouth. So if you see me speaking quickly and putting my hands in front of my mouth, please let me know. Um, now, I'm sort of, when I was asked to come to this uh, series, I thought, well, this is a very high order to have civil discourse, maybe about anything, um, especially about history. And uh, I hope, uh, it's, it's, I thought Alex was very optimistic that we would be able to have a civil discourse. And I hope that uh, that uh, 
is his prediction is true, and if not here, then elsewhere about this topic. Uh, I'd like to begin any topic uh, that deals with um, federal Indian law, as it's called, with the definitions of what these terms mean. Um, sovereignty uh, is defined in the dictionary. It's a word, it's a concept, it's a term we, we use. And it means, surprisingly, supreme power. Supreme power. Now, that may be an odd concept today. Uh, when Louis XIV was the king of France, uh, it wasn't so far-fetched. Uh, he was known to have said, L'etat c'est moi, I am the state. I am the, I am the, uh, the, the country. Uh, which was a uh, statement that held true until his great-grandson, Louis XVI, was separated from the state and his head and his body uh, in the revolution. So sovereignty then, uh, it's interesting that the, the, the term is defined in the Oxford Dictionary of the American language and it cross-references jurisdiction. And I've never seen this, this, this happen in a dictionary where you cross-reference another, another word. And that's an apt uh, cross-reference because jurisdiction relates to the official power to do something. And in our sovereigns today, especially in republics, and there are a few uh, absolute monarchs in the world, the pope is one of them, uh, but in republics and other governments today, uh, power, the absolute power, the, the supreme power, is divided among various institutions or, or people. So the president in the United States has jurisdiction over certain things. The Congress has jurisdiction over other things. The courts have jurisdiction over lots of things, or not. So it's important, I think, to think of sovereignty in the context of jurisdiction. What is the scope of the power the sovereign has? It's not absolute uh, anymore. Um, now, when we talk about uh, indigenous peoples, and I, I prefer the term, I, I'll use the term tribe in this uh, handout. By the way, did everybody get the handout? Yeah. Um, because I, I prefer the term indigenous peoples, I will use the term tribe here because we're all familiar with it, I guess, but indigenous peoples is the term that is references the community of peoples that are a self-governing community. They are indigenous peoples. Indigenous people or individual indigenous people. And I use that term because it is the term that is used in the United Nations uh, 2007 Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples, and it's the term that the indigenous peoples use for themselves in negotiating that agreement. So I think we should keep in mind that these terms change as time goes on. Uh, and the word tribe is a little bit suspect among, I think, most indigenous peoples. Um, but this, the, the concept of sovereignty and the position of indigenous peoples in our law, it's the law we have made about them, it's not the laws the indigenous peoples have made for themselves, begins, um, well, or you might expect it be, to begin, when Columbus uh, returned to uh, Spain in 1493, having encountered indigenous peoples in the Caribbean uh, islands of Hisp Hispaniola and elsewhere. And I've been researching this lately. Um, he, uh, when he returned to Spain, well, his diary first, I'm, I'm going to get too long if I talk about this too much, so. But the diary he wrote as, in, as he encountered indigenous peoples was remarkable for many reasons. Uh, first, it was a, really an anthropological assessment, if you will, of, of the people he encountered. And he remarked several times on their, uh, their, their goodness, their kindness, uh, and that they were always laughing. Uh, that was soon to change. Uh, after Columbus returned to uh, Hispaniola and the Caribbean. Because upon his return to, to Spain in 1493, he suggested to the king and queen of Spain that they go to talk to the pope and, to, and ask, ask the pope to confirm their title to the lands that he had found and, uh, and the, that he would find and encounter in the future. And so the pope, a Spanish uh, friend of the king and queen, uh, uh, obliged and issued this bull called Incerta uh, Divinae, Incerta Divinae, among other divine works, in which he said, as it's, it's quoted in this uh, handout, but it's worth maybe repeating, um, that he drew a line between the poles of the North and South Pole, and everything to the west of that line uh, was to belong to Spain, where uh, the 
the king and queen of Spain would have their dominions, cities, camps, places, and villages, and all rights, jurisdictions, and appurtenances, all islands and mainlands found and to be found, discovered and to be discovered towards the west and south with full and free power, authority, and jurisdiction over of every kind. Now, this is the grant of the pope, who was, in, way, way, in many ways, the supreme sovereign at that time, uh, to the king and queen of Spain, to half the world. And that is the position which the king and queen of Spain took when they sent the conquistadores, the conquerors, to the Americas. Uh, time goes on. Um, the uh, United States uh, eventually came to be and ad adopted a constitution. And our constitution has a, a clause in it, known as the Indian Commerce Clause, uh, which grants power to the Congress to regulate commerce with foreign nations among the several states and with the Indian tribes. Now, there's a kind of a grammatic parallel between with nations and with the Indian tribes, which says something about the relationships between those two. Uh, they are both viewed as sovereigns, in these, in this, uh, at least grammatically, in this uh, clause. But what really defines these, such a, this position of the indigenous peoples in America, in our, in our domestic laws, is the common law. And the common law is unique to uh, Britain and its colonies. It is the law that is made up by the court's interpretation of the disputes between people, and it usually involves, in the case of Indian law especially, history. What is the history of the relationship of the indigenous peoples to the, uh, to the uh, colonizing power? Um, the Pope's edict became known as the rule of discovery, and that is, that not only Spain, but any European power, any Christian power, it was all viewed in terms of religion, that discovers a non-Christian land, acquires the exclusive right, the preemptive title to the property. Without the consent of the people, it is a right to land that is, belongs solely to the discovering power by virtue of this doctrine. And the doctrine was brought into the Americas and to the United States by the decision of, in uh, the Supreme Court in Johnson versus McIntosh, which is discussed here. Um, and that decision then created a kind of title in the United States that is a title to the, to the soil that the, that the in, in indigenous peoples uh, occupy. But the indigenous peoples have the, retained the exclusive right to use and occupy that property. So only the United States, you have to be a property lawyer to figure this out, I guess, but can only, only the United States can dispossess them of their, of their use and occupancy by acquiring the aboriginal title. So that's why you have the Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, because the exclusive right to use and occupancy of all of Alaska belonged to the indigenous peoples, really the tribes, the villages, the tribes at the time. A couple of lawsuits that sort of prove that. The United States had to extinguish that title in order to enable these oil companies in the state to get the oil out of Prudhoe Bay. And there's always a, there's always a, a reason that you have these settlements. Something, something pinches the, the system, and they have to settle the aboriginal claim. Uh, and that is the reason you have an, Ab an Alaska Native Claim Settlement Act, uh, because of that, uh, uh, that requirement. If you don't extinguish aboriginal title, the consequence is using it in, in in violation of the exclusive use and occupancy is a trespass. And you could be made to pay f uh, money for the value of that trespass. So it's possible, that, uh, without settling this claim, the oil companies in Alaska could have gone into Prudhoe Bay, sucked all the oil out, and been paid billions of dollars, but had to then get sued and, and disgorge it to the uh, Indian tribes. Uh, so the, that had to be settled before that uh, development could take place. Well, in the course of this encounter with the indigenous peoples in America, the British didn't have the luxury of the, of the Pope's de decrees, so, and they didn't have the conquistadores. They didn't have the power to conquer the, the indigenous peoples in North America uh, because of the, the peoples there in North America were able to defend themselves. So the, as a, after the revolution, and uh, the United States continued in the ma manner of Britain to negotiate treaties with the Indian tribes for their peace and, and, uh, and neutrality and non-opposition, so they could uh, uh, acquire their lands, but not be at war with them all the time. 
And one of these treaties was with, with uh, the Cherokee Nation in Georgia. And uh, that treaty guaranteed the Cherokee Nation, it first it extinguished Aboriginal title to most of Georgia and around and the territory, ter uh, the er territory area, but it confirmed to the Cherokees the exclusive right to govern that land, to retain that land. They didn't grant the Cherokees anything, they reserved to the Cherokees something they had already had, and including the inherent right to govern the property, the, 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 uh, the area, the, their land and their territory. And this, the, the issue came up in court and uh, Georgia tried to ignore this, this treaty and nullify the laws of the state of, uh, of the Cherokee Nation and pr said that they didn't exist. The Cherokees, they, Georgia argued, were savages. They could not have a government. No, they didn't have the capability of having a government. But John, uh, Mar John Marshall, in this case, the uh, Worcester versus Georgia, uh, describes the uh, issues, I mean, uh, this opinion that you have here in the, in, the, in the handout. And briefly, I won't read the whole thing, but it says the Indian nations had always been considered as distinct, independent political communities retaining their original natural rights as undisputed uh, possessors of the soil from time immemorial. Their very term nation, so generally applied to them, means a people distinct from others. The words treaty and nation are words of our own language, and they mean exactly the same thing when we use them in reference to Indian tribes as they do when we use them in reference to other, other kinds of nations. So that's the beginning of the federal recognition of the inherent power of sovereignty of indigenous peoples. And it's not something, it is our law. It's not something that has been Im imposed by somebody else. This is the law, the common law, that the United States created for itself. And so that's the most important thing to remember, is that this law, this common law, with all its failures and all its problems, recognizes that there's an inherent right of uh, self-government. Now, I have this little chart here that explains to me, uh, this I owe to David Getchies, uh, the late David Getchies, who was a giant in this field, but he always explained these, the, the uh, devolution, if you will, of the rights of uh, indigenous peoples in this chart. Begin with the inherent right that any people have to govern themselves, is the, the, that they've sustained by their own political and military uh, abilities. Any nation can do that, and the indigenous peoples in America did. Then we have the rule of discovery, which now deprives them of some of that right, but as a matter of domestic law. It, it, it eliminates their exclusive title to the property by, by our law, not their law, but by our law, and uh, reduces that to a, an exclusive right of use and occupancy, and it then also diminishes the sovereignty that can be, the, the territory over which that sovereignty can be exercised. But when it, the United States negotiates a treaty or other agreement that recognizes the Aboriginal title and confers a reserved area to an Indian community, that is the nation's jurisdiction within that uh, territory, usually a reservation. That didn't happen in Alaska. The, the bottom of the chart tells you what did happen in Alaska. Uh, the Claims Act granted the soil, like the land and resources, to native corporations. That had never, never been done in American history. Subsistence under, under the Claims Act had a mixed uh, bag, and then, the, and then later the Alaska National Interest Lands Conservation Act uh, ended up dis uh, dividing uh, subsistence jurisdiction between state and federal uh, authorities. But sovereignty was left undetermined. The Indian tribes still existed. They weren't thought to exist in, in Alaska at the time of the Claims Act. It was kind of ignored. Uh, but the word is used in the Claims Act to describe native, native villages. They are described as tribes in, in part. Uh, but the tribes who had the original claim of Aboriginal title uh, were not recognized as the beneficiaries of this Claims Act that would reserve that title to them. Instead, the title to the land went to corporations. And then the, the, the question of what the, the Indian tribe, whether, whether they existed or not, was left undecided until 1993. Uh, and, uh, I, and I think Alex will probably get into that. Um, but the tribal jurisdiction in Alaska then is, is unique in the sense that there is no territory to which it is usually attached. And the, uh, the, that, that used to be thought to be an impediment to their jurisdiction. But things happened after 1999, which I think Alex will probably cover, that changed this, the, the, and started to identify 
the scope of tribal jurisdiction as a, as a, as a function of tribal sovereignty in Alaska. Uh, and that's what I think we'll talk about as we go forward. So thank you. Thank you very much, Judy. Um, what I'd like to do now is ask the panel, thank you. If, um, can you hear me? I'd like to ask the panel if you have question or comment on David's before I turn to Alex. I do have a comment, and David and I talked about this earlier, um, where in the chart it says that ANCSA corps are attached to the soil. Right? And ANCSA corps are the owners of the land, uh, and we know, of course, that there is a split, a state between surface and subsurface. But our ANCSA corps also do much more than own the soil. Right? And I think that's part of what makes them distinct. Shareholders look to ANCSA corps for connection to culture. ANCSA corps are permitting hunting on that private land and regulating access to hunting. Um, and, and then there are some provisions in ANCSA itself, like 14H1, that are about protection of sacred sites and identifying them. So I think it goes to uh, what has been noticed by so many people. Alaska is often the exception, not the rule. And so in my mind, those are the exceptions, just a few of them, I'm sure there are many more, of what ANCSA corporations do in our Alaska Native communities today. I didn't have any comment because I every every almost every section I wanted to go off and explain more. <laughs> Good. <laughs> okay. Well, let's let's then turn to uh, Alex Cleghorn, and um, Alex uh, had worked with John uh, Lindemuth, uh, who was the Attorney General in the Walker administration, and um, I hope you'll talk a bit about how that developed. Before I do that, I do want to take a moment and introduce myself. Uh, my name is Alex Cleghorn, and I was born here in Anchorage. Uh, my mother's family is from Dillingham, though not native. Uh, and my father's family is from Kodiak. And both of them came here with their families for opportunities. They met here, and this is where I was born. Uh, though I grew up mostly in the interior, I grew up in Fairbanks. Uh, and I think uh, reflective of Alaska's unique legal landscape, that means that I am a citizen of a tribe. Right? I'm a citizen of Dognignoc Native Village, also known as Woody Island. And I'm a shareholder in Alaska Native corporations, both regional and village corporations. And I come to this work and to the work that we did specifically in the Walker administration. Um, I've been a lawyer for 20 years, and most of that, I've been a tribal attorney. Uh, and before I came home to Alaska, I was a tribal attorney in California. And I brought that experience uh, back home with me. And I'm going to turn to talking about the work that we, we did on the AG opinion, I think it is um, telling that we're here for the historical society. And when I was doing this work, it was some of my first introduction and a history lesson uh, to federal Indian law and native claims that many people in this room lived. I was learning about it. And um, what, I, what I learned uh, you know, has informed the work that, that I've done since then at the Alaska Native Justice Center. But the first thing that I want to say about uh, the AG opinion is share a little bit about how an AG opinion comes to be and the purpose of that opinion. So um, you know, the, a client asks for an opinion. They ask a question of the Department of Law and uh, that's what happened here. And so in the, in the Ray line, you know, RE line, you will see the status of Alaska tribes. And uh, that request uh, is answered 
by the Attorney General, though the drafting of it, um, the back and forth of it, the internal vetting of it uh, is something that took quite some time. And while I think it's fair to say that I was the primary author of it, there were other reviewers of it. It has to be reviewed by the Deputy Attorney General and the Attorney General herself before it's issued. And part of the impact of an AG opinion is that it is a, a statement of what the law is at that time. And um, the AG opinion was designed to answer settled questions of law. Uh, it wasn't designed to answer unsettled questions of law, of still might be open legal questions about some things. And it was issued in 2017. So there have been significant changes in federal law that would impact, uh, the, I believe, the positions that were taken or the statements that were made in the AG opinion. And uh, I was very excited to see that one of the questions from these very bright high school students has to do with VAWA 22, and I hope we get a chance to talk about that. But I do want to turn to talking about what the opinion says um, and why it was important. Uh, the opinion says that there are 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska and that um, it does not require the state to recognize them, that it is a federal determination. Uh, it also made sure to say that Alaska Native people and tribes have a, uh, existed in Alaska for thousands of years and that that recognition uh, by the federal government had been solidified since 1993 and 94. So there was no longer an open legal question about whether or not there were federally recognized tribes. And it highlights that inherent sovereignty had been recognized by all three branches of the federal government and the Alaska Supreme Court. So we want to pause and talk about the Alaska Supreme Court because that decision in 1999 in John V. Baker is what s settled the question or should have settled the question about whether or not there were tribes in the state court's opinion and the fact that tribes had jurisdiction over their citizens regardless of this question of land. And as a, a side note here, you know, when, I, when we were doing this work, uh, there were lots of folks who thought that only Alaska tribes didn't have land, that we were very unique in that regard. Um, but I had learned from my work in California that wasn't true. There were dozens of terminated tribes. In the 1950s, the federal government's position and policy position on uh, Indian tribes was that they wanted to get out of the Indian business, so they were terminating that federal relationship between tribes and the federal government. And dozens of tribes in California had been terminated. And even though there had been lawsuits for those tribes to regain that federal recognition, many of them had lost the land. The land had been busted up, had been you know, given to individual people. Those families, many of them couldn't afford to pay the taxes, and the land was seized and was no longer in Indian hands. And trying to put a reservation back together was very challenging. But those tribes were just like Alaska. They didn't own the land. Um, I think the other thing to, to note about the position in the AG opinion is that it highlighted some of the history of the state's positions about tribes. So we talked about John V. Baker, right? That's the Supreme Court. Well, there's two other branches in, in our state government, right? We have uh, the administrative or executive branch, and we have the legislature. And uh, the state in those other branches had been taking positions uh, about the fact that tribes may not have existed or that tribes in Alaska were so different that they didn't have jurisdiction. Um, there were well-litigated questions over the years about this, and resoundingly, 
each answer uh, from a court that looked at it was yes, there are tribes in Alaska, yes. John V. Baker's recognition that the land status is separate from the jurisdiction over citizens was correct. They refused many attempts uh, for those questions to be uh, relitigated. I think also what was highlighted was part of what David was talking about, that there were common misunderstandings about ANCSA and what it did and what it meant and these ideas of sovereignty and jurisdiction and land got all tangled up when folks were thinking and talking about ANCSA. And one of the things that I think is important when we look at these questions and do this work is to be very careful and deliberate in looking at what was actually said and what may have been meant. And that foundation also of federal Indian law that David laid for us was so important in looking at these, at these issues. So Alaska is different, but not that different, that these foundations uh, don't apply to us. Um, I do wanna turn a bit to uh, the statements or the ideas of what Alaska tribes can and do do every day in Alaska. So Alaska tribes are sovereign governments. This means that in many villages, tribes are the government that is operating on the ground, that is making uh, decisions about protecting people, that is helping solve community concerns, uh, that they are making decisions about electing their own representatives, making decisions about who can be a citizen, uh, and that sovereign power, that central power to establish a government uh, is key. I always like the, the quote, uh, I think it's from Williams, right? What is sovereignty in that discussion? And uh, what is sovereignty in, in that dis decision is um, the right to make your own laws and be governed by them. Now it certainly does get more interesting when we start talking about tribes regulating non-citizens and non-native people. But I'll save that discussion for a little bit later on because I think that some of these questions uh, asked by the high school students uh, tee up those ideas really well. Good, well, <clears throat> thank you very much. Do other members of the panel wish to comment or question? I was thanking him for his work. Oh, okay. <laughs> well, then, if we, if we could, then we'll uh, we'll move to uh, Rosita, Rosita Whirl. Uh, Dr. Whirl, for years, has been working um, on these issues in southeast Alaska and other parts of Alaska, and has a background, I like to put it, on the ground. Thank you, most noble and honorable people, for allowing me to be here to speak to you today on this very, very important uh, subject. My Tlingit names are Yadeklatsak. It's an ancient name. The meaning has been lost in time. My ceremonial name is Kahani, meaning woman who stands in the place of a man. It comes from a historical event when we traded with our interior relatives and uh, we would bring rifles up and our relatives would have to stack fur as high as the rifle and that was the, our our commercial transactions with them, and that's where my name comes from. I am an eagle from the Thunderbird clan, and I am from the house lowered from the sun uh, from Klakwan in the Chilkat region. I am also very proud to be a child of the Hlukahadi or the Sakai clan, meaning I am a child not only of my father, but of his entire clan. Uh, in addition, our clan claims ownership rights to US, the U.S. Naval military uniform and to the name Lieutenant Schwatka because Lieutenant Schwatka failed to pay a debt to my great-great-clan grandfather. So the Thunderbirds wear 
uniforms or the semblances of uniforms, and we have people in our clan who are called Schwatki, my Schwatka. Um, Alaska Natives have, have asserted that they possess sovereign rights under the American administrations, and they have pursued the recognition of those rights. They have a long recognized, we also have a long recognized interrelationship between their land rights and sovereignty. With the sale of, the, of, of Alaska to the United States, the Clinkets immediately asserted their sovereignty. They said, the land belonged to us. And if the United States wanted to buy Alaska, they had to buy it from its rightful owners. A council of our clan leaders went to the Chilkat area to discuss whether they should wage war against the United States. They decided, taking, they decided against taking military action noting that they had bought their weaponry from the Americans to keep the Russians at bay. They also note, noted that their villages were located on the coast and could be easily bombed. This belief became a reality when in the late 1800s, the military bombed three of our villages. The Klan leaders also recognized that the Boston men, as they called the Americans, had an extremely large population in comparison to, the, to our population that already had been significantly reduced because of the introduction of new diseases into our country. Instead, the Clinkets initiated both a legal and political campaign dispatching a lawyer to DC who would argue that the natives owned Alaska. This was a campaign they pursued uh, for the next 100 years. Perhaps one of the first recorded assertions of sovereignty by the Clinkists, as reported by David Case and his colleague David Volokh in their classic publication on Alaska Natives and American Law, the Clinkists asserted their sovereignty in the 1866 Risa Kwok case. Sawqua was a Haida slave owned by a Sitka clan. The Clinkets argued that they retained their own governing authority ex exclusive of US laws and had the sovereign authority to maintain their practice of slavery. The Alaska Federal District Court rejected the sovereign authority of the Clinkets to maintain the practice of slavery and held that the Clinkets were subject to the 1862 Emanci Emancipation Proclamation memorialized in the 13th Amendment uh, to the United States Constitution. The Indian Reorganization Act of 1934 allowed American Indians living on reservations to establish tribal governments, and it also authorized the U.S. Secretary of the Interior to acquire and hold land in trust for tribes. These initial IRA uh, provisions did not apply to Alaska Natives, and the Southeast Alaska Natives, through the Alaska Native Brotherhood, sought an amendment to the IRA to include Alaska. As a result of their efforts, the IRA was amended in 1936 to allow Alaska Natives uh, to organize on a village basis to form tribal governments. Alaska Natives saw the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act of 1971 as a land transaction. They elected not to pursue their land claims through tribes and reservation lands. They wanted, we wanted full ownership of our lands and opposed lands held in trust by the federal government. Corporations and fee simple title lands provided the vehicle for full ownership of our lands. While land ownership is not necessarily a requisite for a native, native governmental uh, jurisdiction or sovereignty, there is a significant geographic component to tribal ju jurisdiction over, matter, over many matters, including jurisdiction over non-members. 
Alaska Native tribes are sovereign entities without a land base, except for the Matlakatla Indian Reservation and a few tribes that have been able to transfer land into trust. AFN, the Alaska Federation of Natives, tried to rectify this through the 1991 ANCSA amendments. In the early 1980s, Alaska Natives began to understand the flaws and dangers of ANCSA. In 1982, delegates to the AFN convention directed AFN to make the 1991 issue its top priority. The 1991 uh, uh, reference was to the provisions in the law that would allow for the lifting of restrictions on the sale of stock. AFN convened five native, native leadership retreats and seven conventions to develop ANCSA amendments to the perceived problems. The so-called 1991 ANCSA amendments were signed into law on February 3, 1988. The basic provisions provided for the protections of both native land and corporations by providing for automatic protections for undeveloped land, protecting ANCSA lands from taxes and from being taken for a bad debt and bank's bankruptcy, providing for the restrictions on the sale of stock, issuing stock to natives born after 1971 and others who had missed the initial uh, enrollment and allowing for issuance of stock uh, for and special benefits for elders. AFN, however, was unable to secure the tribal option, which would have allowed native corporations to transfer lands to a federally recognized tribe. Congress insisted that a disclaimer clause that was designed to maintain the status quo of tribal rights and, and governments be included in the amendments of the land transfer if the land transfer provisions were included. AFN dropped the tribal option, believing that the disclaimer clause would undermine tribal sovereignty. The idea of seeking congressional approval to transfer ANCSA lands to tribes was abandoned, but the sovereignty movement became entrenched. Tribes began to, in earnest to assert their sovereign rights. They organized under, initially under the Alaska Intertribal Council, which sought to protect and uh, strengthen tribal governments. They also began to exercise their governmental powers. I remember David used to say, use it or lose it. <laughs> A AFN also continued its efforts to the rec for the recognition of tribes in Alaska. And I know this firsthand as I served as the chair of the Alaska Native Policies uh, uh, Committee working on this issue. In 1986, I went to work for Governor Steve Cooper as his Native and Rural Affairs staff person. We had an agreement. If I advocated for the recognition of 200 sovereign tribal entities in Alaska, he would fire me. <laughs> if he failed to recognize that Alaska Natives have a special trust relationship with the federal government, I would resign. I immediately went to work with two commissioners and several staff persons to define the state's relationship with Alaska Natives. This resulted in the Native policy statement that was described by Governor Cooper as the first comprehensive outline of his administration policy on Native affairs. It was also described by a Native American Rights Fund lawyer as the first state policy of its kind in the nation. The statement read that Alaska Natives are citizens of the state of Alaska and enjoy the same political rights of other citizens. However, the state also recognized that the federal government maintains a special relationship with Alaska Natives and it supported the continuance of this unique relationship. Kind of a lukewarm recognition, but it was there. As part of this research, I also had uh, OMB assess how much money came into the state as a result of the status of Alaska Natives under federal law and their entitlements for special federal funds and programs. 
In 1988, the funds were, we were able to identify totaled approximately $285 million. When I showed this number to Governor Cooper and told him that if na Native people should lose their special status, then the state would have to come up with that money. He directed that I show the report to the state legislators. The statement went on to say that while the state recognized the existence of tribal councils and that for some purposes, many of those councils should be considered tribes under, under various federal statutes, the statement read that the nature and, and extent of their sovereign authority, if any, is undefined. The statement certainly wasn't all that I wanted, but I had felt we had made some progress in the recognition of tribes. In 1990, Governor Cooper formally formalized the Native Policy Statement in the adoption of the Administrative Order Number 123 that recognized the existence of tribes in Alaska. He went even further in stating that the Native residents of a majority of communities listed as a Native village in ANCSA should also be considered a tribe. The administrative order noted that tribes have some powers whether they occupy reservations or not. The extent of the power of off-reservation tribes is not fully defined in the law, but it includes the right to define the tribe's own membership and to regulate its own internal affairs. A tribe also has many ex uh, uh, powers express expressly granted to it by the federal government such as the Indian Child Welfare Act, whether or not it occupies a reservation. We know that ICWA now is under threat. Um, Governor Tony Knowles affirmed the recognition of tribes through Administrative Order Number 186. He also started a major project called the Millennium Agreement, which was meant to be a framework for the establishment of lasting government-to-government -government relationships and an implementation procedure to assure that such relationships are constructive and meaningful and further enhance cooperations between the parties. The next governor, Walter J. Hickel, rescinded Governor Knowles' administrative order. He described Alaskans as all one people, having no room for administrative recognition of a special political status for Alaska Native peoples. The Federal Indian Tribal List of 1994 recognizes tribes in Alaska and affirms the sovereign status of such tribes and the United States obligation as part of its trust responsibility to maintain government-to-government -government relations with, with them. Alaska Natives sought the same recognitions from the state of Alaska. The Alaska Tribal Recognition Act was signed into law by Governor Mike Dunleavy on July 28, 2022. The bill formally recognizes all of Alaska's 229 federally recognized tribes, but it does not impact the current legal status of Alaska uh, tribes or changes the state's responsibilities or authority. The new law offers acceptance and recognition of tribes. How much more it does is unclear, but Alaska Natives have high hopes. Some see the Recognition Act as a basis for a strong partnership between tribes and the state of Alaska, like those between tribes and the federal government. Others have said they hope to, it sig signals the end of state laws, lawsuits challenging tribal sovereignty. In, in enacting ANCSA, Congress exercised its constitutional powers by recognizing ANCSA corporations as an Indian tribe without governmental jurisdiction over its members. ANCSA corporations are not on the Federal Indian Tribal List Act of 1994 enacted by Congress. ANCSA corporations, however, are defined as Indian tribes for special statutory purposes in over 117 legislative acts. Additionally, 
The recent Supreme Court held in the Yellen B. Chehalis Confederated Tribes of Chehalis Reservation that ANCSA corporations shall continue to be defined and included as an Indian tribe under the Indian Self-Determination and Education Assistance Act. In November 2000, President Clinton signed its Executive Order 13175, which requires federal agents agency consultation and coordination with Indian tribal governments. However, it did not include Alaska Native Corporations. With a large land base, uh, ANCs, uh, Sea Alaska Corporation, through its, uh, through, thought it important that the federal government also consult with ANCs. Sea Alaska successfully pursued a legislative fix to ensure that consultation also applies to Alaska Native Corporations. The first legislative uh, provisions directed the Office of Management and Budget to consult with ANCs on the same basis as Indian tribes under the executive order. However, some agencies held that the consultations with ANCs only applied to OMB. So Sea Alaska had to go back for the second time to secure a, another legislative act to ensure that all agencies consult with ANCs. ANCs have pursued economic sovereignty and have diligently protected the recognitions of ANCs as tribes for special statutory purposes because of the economic benefits and special protections they provide but they do not claim to be sovereign entities. The history of Alaska Natives demonstrates, demonstrates a resolve by Alaska Native people to meet the legal and political ch challenges to their sovereignty in a variety of ways that maximizes their self-determination and self-governance. Well, I think that was a historic uh, event that you just presented, <laughs> frankly. Uh, uh, thank you. It was a very comprehensive uh, description of the facts. Thank you very much. One of the things that I've observed um, <clears throat> when I first got involved in looking at these issues, it seemed to me that sovereignty was being eroded. And yet, Put the mic to I, it seemed to me that sovereignty was being eroded. Will, put it, put it right next to your mouth That's like it. this. When I first got involved in some of these issues, it seemed to me that sovereignty was being eroded through time. But I think through the types of comments you've made and what you've written on before, Rosita, that it gives us an indication that Sovereignty is something that's emerging in new directions and finding new power and new purpose and new opportunity. And I'm thinking in terms of um, the areas of medicine and the way in which tribes have come together on that, as well as in movements now in the education realm of tribes coming together to assert themselves. So I'd be interested in your comments on that before we turn to more general questions. Well, I, I want to first start by responding with, um, I guess David used to say, use it or lose it, right, about sovereignty. One of the things I heard as a, as a young tribal attorney uh, was sovereignty is like a muscle. If you don't use it, it gets weak. But the good news is, when you start using it, it gets strong. And so I think that, I'm not sure that, uh, I think that sovereignty waxes and wanes. And I mean, there certainly have been federal actions that have diminished jurisdiction in particular in the areas of criminal law and tribes 
ability to regulate non-native people or hold them to account uh, for bad behavior and violence in our communities. But I also think that what I would add to what you shared about healthcare, which I agree with, right, that that um, and the turn towards education is very important. But there was great change in the federal law in Violence Against Women Act of 2022. And um, we now have a definition around uh, inherent authority that includes talk of an area. I'm using my words really carefully here because it doesn't recognize that tribes have jurisdiction over land, right? It's not that kind of territorial jurisdiction. But it is a statement that uh, Congress recognizes and affirms the inherent authority of any Indian tribe occupying a village in the state of Alaska to exercise criminal and civil jurisdiction over native people within the village. So it is a two-step process. It's a tribe that is occupying a village. And the definition of village refers back out to ANCSA, the ANCSA definition of village. And then it actually refers out to some maps. So you can now go and look, and tribes are going and looking at those maps. And tribes in Alaska are starting to take advantage of some opportunities to explore a more robust criminal justice response to violence within those areas. Right? And this definition was hard fought and it recognized that uh, creating Indian country, so to speak, in Alaska was not something that was politically feasible. It didn't, it, it impacted uh, the interests of ANCs and the state and others, but crafting such a definition about uh, tribes within a village was able to skirt that issue and create the foundation that I think is going to be built on over the next 20 or more years. When it comes to criminal justice and public safety and justice, I think that this is a very exciting time in Alaska. And I think we have uh, what some tribal leaders are starting to call a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity to start to build on this. And if I could just add to that, I mean, I've always thought that sovereignty of uh, indigenous sovereignty in Alaska was not a threat to anybody. It's a tool. It's an institution, an institutional concept that puts governmental authority into the villages where it doesn't exist, where the, where the state is not present in these 239 villages throughout the, throughout the state. It's just not there. There's no courts, there's no police. Uh, and uh, so the, the sovereignty of tribes offers a tool, an institution, that can put law and order there. Uh, and it is it supplements and enforces, reinforces uh, the, the condition, the interest in everybody in having safe communities uh, where women are protected, children are protected, uh, uh, the, 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 the community isn't terrorized by a lone guy with a gun. You know, it's these, um, uh, because, the, well, that's, 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 that's what I think it is. And, and that's why it is so important for the whole state of Alaska to ac accept and acknowledge that the the, the tribal sovereigns are there. And creative uh, resolutions or approaches like you've just described uh, reinforce that idea. You don't have to have exclusive jurisdiction over something to be able to do something about a problem. Um, and, that's ex and, and that's exactly what we have here. Um, I mean, I don't mean to sound too hopeful, but, <laughs> but the concurrent, the fact is the state of, of Alaska has jurisdiction under a, another federal law called PL 280 over all crimes, any place in the country, whether uh, any place in Alaska, whether it's, quote, Indian country or not. And that doesn't change. And the fact that the tribes exercise sovereignty in these areas, that doesn't change that either. The, if the state wants to exercise jurisdiction over crimes, it can. Um, 
And uh, so it's not really a threat. So tribal sovereignty is not a threat in any way to the state's uh, authority, I think. I, d I just wanted to add um, kind of another dimension to this. Um, people may wonder why, you know, we initially, we asserted that we had sovereignty and we fought for that sovereignty. But I mentioned that um, three of our villages were bombed. That was just one thing that happened to Native people. Native people were suppressed. And I know we don't want to talk about it, but it is part of our history that we have gone through a horrible suppression of Native cultures and just our being. And, and, I, and I, you know, I think that the discussions that Native people had in the 1980s, where they came together in those five Native leadership retreats were really phenomenal, where we as a Native people came together and we said, these are the things that are important for us. And we began to seek those things through an amendment to ANCSA. And I think ANCSA itself gave us the economic strength to then begin to really work on these tribal sovereign issues. And I know that you know people might not recognize it, but you see AFN as, a, as an ANC-dominated organization. Well, I will tell you that it was AFN that worked with the three different statewide tribal organization to get that recognition of tribes, to get that tribal list enacted. So it took us a while, you know, to overcome, you know, I now, I, people talk about it right now as intergenerational trauma. And so it, it took us a while to get over that. And, and so, but now we're working, you know, aggressively, not only in the, in the sovereign area, but also in other areas to try to educate uh, Alaskans or educate non-native people about the good things in our culture. We, we say we're trying to promote cross-cultural understanding and showing people that there is good in our culture, but there's also good in us having our own political authority. We're not, in, you know, we're not threatening anyone. Uh, we want to work together, and I think that you know, the, if we did a good study right now, we would show the benefits of having tribal governments in Alaska. Uh, I did that study of the money just to show, I mean, they always say money talks, you know? And so I did that and said, if we don't have that, you know, we, all of this money, all these special programs from Alaska will go, and we would be a, a, a less you know, rich state if we didn't have the political sovereignty, if we didn't have the cultural diversity of Alaska Native people. And um, I want to reflect on that a bit. We need to get the questions too. Do you want to get the yeah, questions? Yeah, we're going to go to questions as soon as you finish. Okay. One thing I didn't mention, and it's kind of glossed over, it's an historical, I think a very important historical fact, is the Treaty of Session in 1867 uh, contains an article which uh, divides the people in the territory uh, between the uncivilized tribes and all the other inhabitants. Now those are the two divisions that are dis discussed. Uncivilized tribes, which was a common phrase to describe tribes in the, 18, in the 19th century. They were by definition uncivilized. Um, and, but all the other inhabitants could re return to Russia and, re and keep their, their, their citizenship or remain citizens of the United States. The uncivilized tribes were subject to such uh, laws and re regulations as the United States may from time to time, and we are still in time to time, uh, adopt in regard to the aboriginal tribes of that country. So the treaty, it's, and Seward, when he put this before the, uh, John, President Johnson's cabinet, the, said the natives in Alaska to be treated on the same footing as the tribes in the United States, U states. And he had a little note that said that. So there's no doubt in uh, what the treaty meant when it was adopted. That was ignored. Uh, and for a century, we f f f fluttered around with what, this, what, the, what tribes, what status tribes had, when all the time the treaty says exactly what they have. They have the same rights as uh, other, same status as tribes in the, United, uh, the rest of the state. Um, and I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it at that uh, because we'll have a, we should have time for questions.
Yeah, thanks for the discussion. Uh, really quite rich. Uh, a lot of terms were, were thrown around, and, and just maybe for clarity, if you could talk about the distinction between um, Indian country, tribal sovereignty, kind of um, village governance. I, I'm, I'm trying to kind of position, you know, particularly like in rural Alaska, like the, the role of villages and how you would just kind of make a, make a distinction among those three sort of governing entities among others. Um, that might be a good place to start, thanks. <laughs> I wrote the book, but I certainly don't have all the answers. Uh, <laughs> It's um, the, 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 the institutions, the things, you, concepts you were concerned about were Indian country, the villages, and what else? So, Tribal sovereignty. Tribal sovereignty, okay. So this whole field of what is called federal Indian law is, is based on a history. It is not so much based on, well, more and more con Congress is enacting statutes. But it is this history of the interaction, the political, economic, and military interaction among the uh, colonizing powers, in the case of the United States, and the individual uh, indigenous uh, peoples. So that's, that, that history makes it complex. It makes it complex to discuss these things. Because I used to say, Indian law, federal Indian law, isn't complicated. It's just ambiguous. Uh, and so you have to have a tolerance for ambiguity. <laughs> Now, Indian country is a term that is defined, um, well, it, it was first used when the British drew a line, a, a treaty line along the Appalachian Mountains that divided the colonies from the Indian country to the west. And your colonies were not supposed to go into the Indian country. It caused the American Revolution. Um, but it's, it is the place, and Congress has defined it from time to time in statutes. So it, it means any reservation, there's a statute now that defines it, it means any reservation any allotment or uh, allot allotment, which in includes town sites in Alaska, we think, uh, or any dependent Indian community. Now, what's a dependent Indian community? Uh, that's still something uh, to be uh, worked out, <laughs> if, if, if ever. But that is what Indian country is. And essentially, it's land over which the, and this is a, another Supreme Court case, the Venati case out of Alaska. It is land over which the federal government exercises superintendence, kind of control. That is as much as I can tell you about what Indian country is. It is usually associated with the territorial jurisdiction of a tribe. It, it is the territory, the, the geographic area over which a tribe exercises jurisdiction. In Alaska, we have tribes that exercise jurisdiction outside of Indian, Indian country based on uh, the, the, another set of standards that have been decided in the, in the Alaska Supreme Court. Um, the, so tribal sovereignty is an inherent power that an indigenous community has. It's not, it's not given to it, it's there because it existed from the beginning and our, and our common law recognizes that. So that's the, if when you talk about sovereignty, we mean the inherent power of an indigenous community to govern itself. And a village in Alaska, villages in Alaska are those communities. Uh, that's, they have been there uh, since uh, for time immemorial, and they have the inherent power to, to govern themselves. And um, so one of the segue here, the, the Alaska natives, as Rosita said, have done, they have taken control. The Claims Act was intended, well, maybe it wasn't intended, but it was, it was written in a way that it would self-destruct in 20 years. I won't go into it, but uh, we all know that was true. Uh, and the Alaska Natives went to Congress and got that fixed. Uh, one of the things that came out of the Alaska Native Claims Settlement Act is the indigenous peoples of Alaska knew how to mine Congress. <laughs> and for every year, in its first 40 years after it was enacted, uh, every Congress for the first 40 years after it was enacted, ANCSA was amended. And that was because the Alaska Natives were knowledgeable and went back to Congress and they fixed things. Um, and uh, otherwise we would have a failure of a settlement, frankly. It would, the, the land would have been lost, it would have been taken by uh, other corporations, including, uh, you know, could, could be owned by Saudi Arabia if, um, if those uh, issues hadn't been resolved. 
to retain the restrictions on the stock and retain the ownership uh, in the Alaska Native Corporations. Now, um, uh, so does that answer your question? Okay. All right, so, th but I want to think that, you just think of uh, this, all this whole discussion of sovereignty, it's about stories. It's about stories about human beings grappling with issues, each other, uh, and, uh, and it's about those stories. And the common law tells stories, that's what it does. And so if you like stories, you'll like reading Indian law cases. <laughs> <laughs> Sure, so I don't know if everybody has this, but I will, I will read student question number two and then uh, try to answer it and perhaps spark a discussion about it. So question number two says, the semi-sovereign status of tribes can be complicated and cause tension. And then there's a quote, and then the quote is from VAWA 22. Congress recognizes and affirms the inherent authority of any Indian tribe occupying a village in the state of Alaska to exercise criminal and civil jurisdiction over all native people present in the village. And then the question is, why should tribal governments in Alaska have precedence over state and national governments in prosecuting crimes on their land? So, I first want to go back to the second word in the question where it says semi-sovereign. And uh, I think that is an interesting discussion. Uh, but my thoughts on, on, on that terminology uh, are that um, it doesn't quite reflect either the status of the law or the reality on the ground. Uh, and the reality on the ground, as David was talking about, is often that tribes are the governments that are responding to the issues in the community. And I don't think that they're so semi-sovereign. I think that federal law has placed some restrictions on tribes' ability to prosecute certain types of crimes and how long they can incarcerate people for committing those crimes. But now I want to turn to this, the question, why should tribal governments in Alaska have precedence over state and national governments in prosecuting crimes on their lands? Well, I think there's two ways to respond to this question. One is to act as if tribes have precedence. And the other is to respond with the facts and the law as, as it exists. So the facts and the law as it exists are that tribal governments do not have precedence. Jurisdiction is concurrent. And concurrent is a fa fancy word for shared. So there are situations where a tribe, the state, and the federal government could all have jurisdiction over an incident that happens over a story, over the kernel of a story that can turn into a case. And that uh, is core to understanding jurisdiction, not just in Alaska, but in the numerous other states that are what are called public law 280 states. We're just sharing jurisdiction. I've only ever practiced in public law 280 states, so I don't know any other way. It means that you need cooperation and collaboration between the state, the tribe, and the feds. And as I was reading this, I was also reflecting on conversations uh, that we had around uh, the drafting of the AG opinion. And um, I think uh, it, was, it was the AG who said, the state is approaching jurisdiction as a zero-sum game. That if tribes get something, the state loses something. And so focusing on the law and the facts of shared 
jurisdiction, concurrent jurisdiction, should be able to ease that concern. The state can, and in some ways is welcome and asked to come and exercise jurisdiction, particularly when horrible violence is happening in the community. Um, and so, uh, to turn to answering this question by assuming that it's true, the facts in it are true, right? Why should tribes have precedence? Well, tribes should have precedence because they are the closest government to what's happening. So if you strike out precedence and you replace it with another word, why should tribal governments in, a, in Alaska be responding to community concerns? It's because they're the government that's there. It's because it's a government made up of native people who understand all the issues that are at play. And I think that um, Judge Abby Abenati states it really well. Judge Abby Abenati is the Yurok uh, Supreme Court judge, uh, which is a tribe in California. And when she talks about the differences between Western justice and tribal justice, she says that one of the key differences is that in Western justice, we think that people who know nothing about what's going on make a better decision, that it's fairer to have strangers make decisions. And that in tribal justice, the idea is that people who are in the community who know what's going on make better decisions. So I think it's a, a fundamental uh, difference in how we approach what is fair and how good decisions can be made. Thank you. David? Yeah, Rosita touched on it in her opening, but the question is about uh, the few Indian reservations in Alaska, like Metlakatla, and the questioner mentions uh, areas around Circle as well. How are they affected by the sovereignty question? How are reservations affected by the sovereignty question? Yeah. Well, there's only one reservation, and it's Metlakatla. Um, and it, um, it, well, it exercises sovereignty over Indian country. That, that, that's the classic uh, status of an of a Indian country where the tribe has uh, primary jurisdiction. Uh, and it is also within a PL 280 state, so the state has jurisdiction, and there's been a special Metlakatla law that I can't quite remember now, but, but there's a, the state has jurisdiction there as well. Uh, but all the other reservations in Alaska were uh, abolished by or shortly after the Claims Act. There's an interesting little story there that we don't have to go into about Clock One, but, um, but uh, Alaska, Metlakatla is the only reservation in Alaska. One little, I want to have one little hair splitting on semi-sovereign. You mentioned it. Um, I, I don't think the Indian tribes are semi-sovereign. They're sovereign, but their jurisdiction is that what the question is, what's their jurisdiction? You don't have to say they're less than sovereign. We just have to say they are sovereign and they have various kinds of jurisdiction. And I'd like to add something here. I know the, quest, the question was about reservations, right? But remember, as David explained, reservations are just but one kind of Indian country, right? We have reservations and we have the allotments and town sites. And so uh, I think it continues to be an open legal question about tribes' jurisdiction within or over those allotments and town sites. Uh, and so I think, um, uh, <laughs> so I think that that's uh, something that's important to point out as well. As I hear it, thank you. Um, it seems everything is talking about the law or jurisdiction in a village over the Indian people or the native people in the village. What happens if there's a non-native person in the village who does something wrong? So uh, we have uh, the United States Supreme Court to thank for a decision called Oliphant. Right. And Oliphant uh, came up in Washington State um, 
And Mr., uh, I believe it was Mr. Oliphant, got drunk at Chief Seattle days and started assaulting people, including a police officer, a tribal police officer. And the tribe arrested him and detained him and was going to prosecute him, as they had been doing to non-Native people for quite some time. But the U.S. Supreme Court decided that tribal courts were not to be trusted when prosecuting non-Native people and did not have the criminal adjudicatory authority to prosecute non-Native people. And so I'm using that, that, those words criminal adjudicatory very specifically because that's taking somebody to trial. Right? They didn't say things about tribes being able to stop and detain non-Native people from committing violence in the community. We've had some additional clarification from the US Supreme Court, I think it was last term in a case called Cooley, where a tribal police officer had stopped somebody for uh, they witnessed a, a law violation and they pulled them over and they saw uh, meth in the car, they saw a dangerous situation for a child that was in the car. Um, and the, the Ninth Circuit decided that uh, tribal police officers should have to let non-native people go when they found out that they were not native people. Uh, but the US Supreme Court found that being able to stop and detain somebody was core to protecting the community. And therefore, tribes could continue to stop and detain non-native people who commit those crimes. So often what is happening, I guess, I don't know if it's often, but what is happening uh, in many villages are that tribal police officers are stopping and detaining people from committing violence. And if it's a person that they don't have criminal jurisdiction over to take to trial and then sentence to uh, prison, they turn it over to the state. And if there's enough evidence there for the state to move forward, this, there would be a state criminal case. Can they uh, kick them out of the village? <laughs> uh, that's a great question. <laughs> the question was, can they kick them out of the village? David, do you want to go first on that? <laughs> well, there was a certain uh, commissioner of a police uh, in Alaska who, uh, uh, Crosby, what was his name? Anyway, um, uh, he said his answer to that was yes. <laughs> and um, I think it's undecided, but villages do do it. And it has been at least... I, I, maybe, I, mean, I don't know if Jenna can, uh, has a better answer to this than I do, uh, uh, but it, it usually seems to get done, and, uh, and that's the last you hear of it because it's not really adjudicated. But, I don't, but the, the, it's, not, it's not clear that there is absolutely jurisdiction to do that. Uh, but you know, that's just because the case hasn't been decided yet. I would also share that in VAWA 22, there is some more clear language about the ability to exclude somebody from a village, but it has not been tested. But the language in the statute, so in federal law, it does now recognize that. Um, but I, I don't believe any troopers have been asked yet to do that. Uh, uh, excuse me. I d Sorry. Yeah, if I could. I just wanted to, to comment, make a comment about, you know, the concern about the inequities of uh, uh, non-tribal members being tried in a tribal court. I just wanted to remind people that we had a study in 1980, in the mid-1980s, that showed that Native people were given sentences that were twice as long uh, for the same crime that a, that a non-Native, you know, committed. So. You know, it goes both ways. But in this case, we didn't have the power. But we, we went and we did uh, training with the judges. And I said, you know, I'm not saying that you're, you're a racist or anything, but your acts are racist. When <laughs> 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 so, I, and I said, I doubt if this training is going to rectify the problem. So, but so, and I think we ended up with, you know, developing, I forgot what they called it, the lawyer guys called it, you know, we'd give the same sentence for the same crime for everybody. They implemented some sort of change. Yes, and Other questions? David, one, one more question. Hi, thank you. I'm wondering if you would comment on educational sovereignty, that is, control over the curriculum, encouraging Native teachers, and that sort of thing. Um, I've always wanted to uh, uh, really bring to people's attention uh, Metlakatla and their educational system, 
They have control over their education, everything. And they have the best scores. They are producing scientists. And I've been you know, trying to get somebody to go down there and really look at it. But it really is that, that control that they have over their curriculum. And so right now, I mean, we, uh, uh, we like at Sea Alaska Heritage are working with schools to try to integrate our, our, lang our language, culture, arts into the schools. And as a result of it, we're seeing that in improved uh, academic achievement and higher school retention. And now we have um, the uh, state tribal education compacting that will uh, allow s some tribes to be able to take over their education. But all of the studies that we've seen really show the improvement in, in the academic achievement. And also, it's good for the non-native students, you know, who are learning about diverse culture, about different worldviews. And in Juneau, it's, it's really great to see, you know, that kind of, where non-native children, I was, you know, we, we have, we have this uh, 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 Friday night, first, uh, first Friday of the month, where we have uh, dances and we have uh, art market. And when we see our kids come dancing in, and this, I just love this story, this little non-native boy, four years old, just came dancing in like that, looked like a clinket warrior. And I said, look at that, we're, we're you know, it's working, you know, this, this collaboration uh, that we can achieve uh, uh, by working together. Let me just say something about the use of the word sovereignty in that context. Uh, sovereignty is being used in lots of different ways that have nothing to do with political sovereignty, with uh, governmental sovereignty. Uh, educational sovereignty sounds to me like it's control of education. That's what we mean. There's also something called food sovereignty. Uh, and and, and I used to give, when I heard these, these terms, I go, oh my goodness, what is that? That, 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 doesn't, that doesn't sound like a real use of the word, but by, actually it's defined. And it means, I think, the uh, a focus or superior concentration on a particular concern, whether it's education or food. But the term, we gotta be sure that when we're using it that way, we don't get it confused with governmental or political sovereignty. Well, this is a follow-up on the earlier question. How did Metlakatla maintain their status as a reservation? Uh, they just said no. <laughs> 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 they had been a reservation for a long time, uh, and they were very clearly a, they had a lot of Supreme Court decisions about them and their status as a reservation. And so they didn't want anything to do with the Claims Act, and they 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 were kept they were left kept out of it. If I could just say something about Klukwan, I'm from Klukwan, and uh, we uh, didn't maintain our our reservation or reserve status. Uh, we elected to go with ANCs, and um, we actually went to Congress and got a a special legislation so that we were also able to participate in ANCSA. So. <laughs> The, uh, my Kukwan is, a, if you're not familiar with it, is a fairly small area uh, in the Tilkad Valley, um, surrounded by a huge mountain ra mountain range of what was thought to be iron ore. <laughs> and when uh, it was determined that there was iron ore there, U.S. Steel went to Congress and got a law passed that created the Kukwan Reserve so that they could lease it for iron ore mining. <laughs> yes, right. And, uh, and so it was a real reservation at the time of the Claims Act. And the Claims Act abolished it without paying for it. And so that is a taking of property. And that, uh, this, I don't know that this is ever, in, I haven't really seen it explained, but that's what it se seemed to go on. And so Klukwan went back to Congress and said, okay, we've gotta, you've gotta pay for this and we've gotta, we have a, we, the price will be participation in the Settlement Act. Right, okay. Uh, so, uh, but that's the way, you see how, the, how this gets manipulated? I mean, because there was a, a thought to be a, a deposit of something that would produce money, uh, the, the Congress and the U.S. Steel Company got together and were able to 
but then, it, of course, it, the, it turned out, this is poetic, it turned out that the iron ore was difficult to mine and get out, so it was not profitable to do, to do it, because it would have taken down the whole mountain behind Kluk, behind Kluk Wan in the Chilkat Indian village and made a slag heap out of it. Um, but then, later on, uh, the Nature Conservancy, let me see if I can get this right, um, was the, the, this, the iron, the steel company, the, it was a Canadian, the Canadians that owned the, owned the, the, the actual uh, mi the mineral estate and the, and the, and the land, uh, or, or the right to it. And they, they actually owned the land, and they wanted to get rid of it. Uh, and the, I, I, won't, I won't tell you who the other bidder was, it was an Alaska State Institution, uh, made it difficult for the Canadian company to get rid of it. And, they, uh, and the Nature Conservancy came in, Nature Conservancy came in, uh, they acquired the land, and they gave it to the tribe. So the Chilkat Indian, Indian village owns the mountains around uh, the village now as a result of all that. Uh, but this also demonstrates why native leaders reject, rejected trust lands because the government could come in and do whatever they wanted to do with trust lands. And we learned that from our brothers and sisters in the lower 48 where vets would go off to war, come back home, find out that their land allotments had been leased to farmers or ranchers for 99 years. So we absolutely did not want to have that. I mean, I, we will document this again, I suppose, uh, but uh, when we wrote the book, the last edition of the book, uh, the native corporations generated about 25% of the gross domestic product of the state. Of the 50 largest uh, in, uh, uh, businesses in Alaska, 25 of them are Alaska native corporations, including the most, uh, the most valuable of them. Um, so the Alaska natives, um, this, this, this does not have anything to do with the tribes in a, in a sense, but in a sense it does because the power in, in a capitalist democracy, you have to have capital in order to have power. And the Alaska Natives do have access to capital as a result of not the Claim Settlement Act, but what they did with it afterwards. Uh, I guess I'll go ahead and try to try to answer question number one. Uh, and question number one from the West High School, um, West, West Valley High School. ANCSA sometimes results in tensions between tribal governments and for-profit decisions by regional corporations. For example, when the Doyon announced a Hillcore deal, the Gwich'in, uh, the Gwich'in tribal government passed a resolution opposing oil and gas development in the Yukon Flats, citing worries about environmental degradation, threats to traditional way of life, and infringement of tri on tribal sovereignty. Uh, and that's from High Country Today. Uh, what adjustments should be made to ANCSA so shareholders and their descendants have as big of a voice as board members? Um, well, first of all, I do have to recognize that there are those tensions between uh, profit-making corporation and, and uh, people who are dependent on the land for subsistence. We see this all over. Um, how have corporations addressed that? Um, most of the corporations have developed their own land policies, and uh, they're, they're similar uh, to the uh, NEPA, the National Environmental Protection Act, where they have to go in and look at the impacts uh, on, on, their, of, on their land, but also on, on their people. And so they, and a lot of them, uh, like Sea Alaska Corporation, have you know, developed uh, land policies that's, that say that our culture, uh, protection of our land, protection for subsistence has to be the highest priority. And so a lot of the native corporations, I mean, corporations don't generally um, uh, put land in, uh, into you know, historical or sacred sites, but a lot of the native corporations have. They've gone to Congress to be able to select more sacred sites. Those are not profit-making entities. The conflict does exist. And uh, it's taken a while, you know, for, for us to figure out how do we deal with this conflict. Uh, in our culture, uh, in, in uh, Southeast, we have a core cultural value called uh, Ha'ani and, and uh, Hashuka. Well, Ha'ani is protecting our land, but also utilizing our land. And in our traditional period, we had 
a balance between utilizing our lands to balance with kind of this sacred and spiritual dimensions about using the land. So when we moved into the Western society, uh, we found out that those same kind of spiritual regulations weren't going to apply to commercial development. And so you, you saw a lot of the corporations uh, develop land departments. Uh, they started to employ uh, scientists. And here they brought in their next core cultural value of strength of, strength of body, mind, and spirit. And so the mind meant education and learning about, edu uh, learning about uh, how do we develop land or can we develop land uh, without uh, impacting you know, the land. And uh, I have to say that I was on Sea Alaska board uh, for 30 years. And um, I kept saying, how do we monetize our trees without cutting them down? How do we monetize our trees without harvesting them? Uh, so we learned uh, about uh, carbon sequestration. We learned about some other kind of things. And we actually uh, lobbied uh, so that we could uh, you know, sell carbon credits. And I thought we were doing a great thing selling carbon credits. And then my granddaughter came and told me, yeah, Grandma, but you allow somebody else to pollute the land. <laughs> so we're back to the drawing board. And in, in our region, we actually uh, ceased all harvesting. And uh, so we're doing carbon credits, but we're still allowing other people <laughs> to, to buy those uh, carbon credits. So it really is, it's a learning process for us. You know, how, how do we do that? And so that you see you know, Native corporations really pushing. Uh, they've developed scholarship programs, uh, internship programs, so that we can, you know, uh, have, grow our own scientists to try to figure out how do we reconcile these two competing worlds. And um, remember, I, I wanted to say that we went with corporations, you know, to protect our land uh, and to protect our culture. And so a lot of the, as, as was mentioned, the a lot of the native corporations have set up uh, organizations like we have, Sea Alaska Heritage Institute, and this is, this is, this is Sea Alaska that set it up. And our job is to perpetuate and enhance our culture. So, it's, it's been a learning process of how do, we, how do we live in both worlds. And I will say we haven't always done a good job, but I, I do know that in looking at, uh, at all of the native corporations, I've looked at all of their vision statements, I've looked at some of their land, not all of them, their land policies, but I, knew, I do know that you know, they, they are aware of that. I mean, they went to Congress to amend ANCSA how many times to try to re-tribalize the, these native corporations that I have to say, we didn't know anything about corporations. We, we knew that it just allowed us to have fee simple title uh, to protect the ownership of our land. We didn't know about all those other things and we had to learn about it. So I think that I think the native corporations are, have been doing a fairly good job in, in learning how to, because a lot of their people are still dependent on subsistence. We know that in our villages, uh, we don't have economies. So we know that our people, we are still dependent on subsistence. And so it's up to us to protect those lands for our, our subsistence uh, users. So how do we, how, what adjustments should be made to ANGSA so shareholders and their descendants have as big of a voice as a board member? You, it's just like government. You elect people to that board that represent your views. And uh, we know that you know, we, have, we have fairly good turnout you know, in, our, in our ANGSA elections. So my recommendation to my granddaughter and, and to other young people, get elected to those boards. And because we're changing, our world is changing, and we have to deal with what our young people are telling us. You know, this is the first time in our history where adults are learning from younger generations. <laughs> and so I applaud my, my grandchildren, <laughs> even if they tell me, Grandma, look at what you're doing. <laughs> Sounds like they've learned from their grandma. <laughs> <laughs> Um, one thing here, and you've mentioned it, Rosita, I'm, I'm not sure if <clears throat> I think the context applies, retribalizing yeah. the uh, corporations. And what, now, this is, has nothing to do with sovereignty so much, but, but is a concept worth talking about. Uh, 
what uh, the question is, what should be changes to be made to actually so shareholders and their descendants uh, have as big a voice? Well, the descendants is the crucial thing because the Claims Act cut off the shareholders as of December 18, 1971. Anybody born after that was not a shareholder unless you inherited it. And as a result of some of these amendments to the Claims Act, the corporations were enabled to open their shareholder roles to anybody. Now this, but they had a uniquely tribal approach to this. Whenever you take on new shareholders in a corporation, those shareholders usually have to do what? Buy the stock. And in the case of native corporations, it's not all of them that followed this model, but the, uh, the ones I'm familiar with, and, uh, and I'm not familiar with Sea Alaska really, but uh, North, the uh, ASRC, the North Slope, and uh, Nana Corporation just opened the rolls. Said anybody who's a descendant of a shareholder is a shareholder of the corporation. Now that is what is called dilute, it dilutes the stock. It dilutes the value of everybody's stock. But it is a uniquely uh, indigenous way of handling property because property is not a thing. It's something that belongs, and I, well, I may be wrong about this, but it belongs to everybody in the, in the community. It's a community approach to property, not an individualistic uh, right. If I could just follow up on that. Um, you know, when, when uh, we were working on ANGSA, uh, Congress saw, you know, they were really happy we wanted to go with corporations because they saw it as a way to assimilate Native people into the economic mainstream. But, and as I said, we didn't recognize it initially until the mid 80s when we began to see all of these different kind of flaws. So we actually amended it. And um, uh, I, I was the chair of the shareholder uh, relations committee and uh, where we were gonna bring a, a vote to the shareholders to vote on whether we should allow our shareholder descendants to come into the corporation. I have to tell the ladies this. Um, when I first proposed the resolution, uh, it was turned down. We only had four women on the board. Uh, it, it was turned down, the guys turned it down, and I started to cry. And the guy said, Rosita, Rosita, we're going we're gonna to deal with this. And I said, darn, I should have learned how to cry earlier. <laughs> 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 but, but we brought that vote, we brought it twice, you know, to our shareholders. And the first time was uh, for one-eighth blood quantum. And, um, and we, uh, our, that resolution uh, was adopted. And I always say that was an assimilationist indicator that we had not been assimilated into the economic mainstream that views uh, society as individuals. But in our society, we're group oriented. And in our culture, children have a right to the land because they are members of a clan, tribe, or group. And so they inherit that right. They have that right on their own. They don't inherit it from their mother or their father. They have an independent right of their own. And so um, um, I, I just think it's a great, you know, great uh, uh, indicator of Alaska Native people today. Uh, we went and actually voted on it a second time. We did a study and um, we found out that there was a, a growing number of, of uh, children who were less than the one-fourth. We, we did a study of that. And so we brought a vote to our shareholders again, and we opened it up to lineal descendants. So as long as you have, can show that you had a parent, grandparent, somebody you know, uh, in the corporation, then you are automatically, you can uh, apply uh, to be a, a shareholder. I'd like to add on to some of these thoughts. I, um, I think about half of the regional corporations have open roles in some way through either life estate stock or other classes of stock. And um, I know that uh, I serve on, on the Cognac board and uh, the way that we've approached it is by asking our shareholders and our descendants what they would like. And it was in, it's interesting data to have because uh, they certainly are split, even some of the descendants are concerned about what that might mean for um, the value of the shares and of the dividends that are given. But 
what we also have done is open many more programs to descendants, right? So that um, there, the, the right to the shares and the dividend that comes with that ownership of the share uh, is not the only benefit that an ANC can provide. And I do want to echo something that I heard Rosita say, which was participate, right? That is the way to change uh, your ANC. And you can participate by voting, actually voting your shares, not by giving a proxy. And um, you know, in, in my time on, on my corporation board, have seen a non-slate candidate get elected to the board because our shareholders didn't vote their proxy, they voted who they wanted to sit on the board. Boy, this has been, this has been wonderful. Uh, we're going to have to cut it off because I think we're going to get kicked out. But uh, before we end, I, I, I do want to say that uh, on Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock, those of you, oh, yeah, right. uh, Monday afternoon at 4 o'clock, those of you that are, are interested in pursuing these questions further, uh, in the Alaska Historical Society in conjunction with Olay program is going to be offering uh, an opportunity to have a discussion and on the sheets that we handed you it it has the the access code for that and Gretchen would you just uh, give a nod to that Gretchen is director of that program Thanks, I'm Gretchen Bursch, and I have the pleasure of chairing the board of Olay Opportunities for Lifelong Education, and we create uh, courses and activities for um, adults, and we're having lots of fun with that. You can find us at oleanchorage.org. And um, months ago in the spring, David and Will uh, came and said, would we partner with them? And we are pleased to do that with a little follow-up broader discussion um, that will happen on Monday with a sort of microscopic um, uh, <laughs> link to that. But uh, you can find that, I'm sure, on Cook Inlet's um, um, website, on the mm -hmm. uh, Historical Society's website, Alaska Historical Society, and I think ours, too. So thanks. We welcome you. We could have a, more of a interchange discussion and we look forward to that. We will be participating in all four. So another one in, um, in um, November, another one in March, another one in April. And it was wonderful to see um, these folks up here. David and I were at Whitman College together a long time ago. And Rosita has been part of an Olay class that I do on uh, Alaska Women of Renown. So thank you. <laughs>